Well, hey guys, welcome back and welcome to the end of the season recap. Yeah, we're going to go over a few things today. I'm going to answer some of your questions, talk about a few things that I'm pretty sure uh, that'll interest you and uh, kind of give you an idea of where we're going with the channel, things of that nature. So let's get started. Well, first of all, um, guys, thank you so much uh, for putting donations into the tip jar over the last couple of days. That's just fantastic. I so appreciate how you're helping out the channel because I can take all that and put it, you know, right back into, you know, new cameras, um, travel expenses, all kinds of different things that are going to keep more or less pushing the channel in a forward di direction. Um, and I really want to uh, just say, you know, give special thanks to the following. Timothy, um, Alan, Richard, Mike, Paul. Joanne, Joanne, thank you very much. That was an incredible donation there. Robert, Neil, uh, Jeffrey B, Michael, Joel, Joel, thank you. Thank you very much. Again, that's a that's just an awesome donation, Joel. I really appreciate it. Uh, Graham, Jason, you too, Jason. <laughs> wow, incredible. Thank you so very much. Um, Jeffrey M, Alice, Alice and William, yeah. You guys, wow. I mean, I don't know what to say. I'm just really speechless. I'm, I'm just so happy that uh, you guys are in, uh, enjoying the channel so much and, and you know, helping it out. That, that's just awesome. You guys are great. And finally, Nicholas. Yeah, these are just some of the uh, people that have donated into the chip jar over the last couple of days. Guys, thank you so very much. I'm, I'm speechless. I, Thank you. I, I can't say thank you enough. I mean, it's just awesome. All right. So what did you think about this, the, uh, the Thunder Ridge Mine? What a series, huh? See, I knew when I started getting into that, that that was going to turn out to be one heck of an awesome, awesome location. And uh, I kind of thought to myself, all right, yeah, yeah, I can see how this thing is going to gravitate to become something way over the top. So I thought that I would implement a, a kind of like a stair step method of storytelling of the mine. We would start at the oldest workings and then finally work our way up to uh, the newer workings, then do an, over, an, an overview and history of the area, and then finally plunge down into the depths of that mine to see what we could find. And lo and behold, wow, um, did it ever turn out to be something spectacular, huh? Absolutely incredible. So. I want to go over a few things that you guys may have missed when you were watching the videos. And uh, some things are obvious, some things were kind of sneaky, you may, might not have caught them. So let's let's go over that a little bit. So the ladder, all right, so every, 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 there was a few people in the beginning that were like, ah, oh, you're never going to need that ladder, so on and so forth. And they were making, you know, hindsight, uh, uh, hind, hindsight comments of things of that nature. Well, like I was saying, there was no way of knowing whether the ladder was going to be needed as I got deeper into that mine. As it turned out, um, I didn't need it. I only needed it to get down that one part, and that was it, because we were able to go around that giant pillar, come up the uh, underneath the old wooden, the old wooden stairs, and uh, um, walk along the gobbing to get up where I needed to get. So the ladder just wasn't needed. But uh, hey, hindsight's twenty twenty, right? Um, when I got down into the bottom of that stope, remember when I found the, the uh, sawhorses? And then right next to the sawhorses, there was that ore pass. Okay, that ore pass was the top part of the ore chute down in the bottom at uh, roughly the 250 or 300 foot level. So when I walked past the ore bucket that was on the wheels on the rail, and I walked past that and went up that one drift, and I looked off to my left, and there was that ore chute. All right, when we were up at the sawhorses, that was the top part of that ore chute. Okay, it was an ore pass into the ore chute. Okay, the uh, yeah, I know. I called it a pulley. It's not. A, it's not called a pulley. The big wooden thing with the groove and the cable. Those are technically called rollers or guides. Um, when they were pulling uh, ore buckets up and down an incline or something something similar to that, they would put those rollers in place 
so that the cable wouldn't bounce uh, off the rock as it's going up and down, particularly over edges. So if the cable is rounding an edge, they would put a roller right there and that would, that would keep, uh, the, keep from the, the, the cable being damaged. Um, the saw horses. You guys notice anything interesting about that? Well, it just so happened that those saw horses were right over the edge from where I set up the ladder. So what someone had done is um, those saw horses were probably up in that area where I was um, drilling in the uh, rock bolt anchors, and then they got pushed over the edge and fell into the bottom. It's quite possible that those saw horses were used to uh, build both the, the stairway coming down, the initial one, to that landing, and then walk across over to the wooden ladder those sawhorses could have been used to build the old wooden staircase down to the top of that gobbing. Yeah, because the sawhorses still had square nails in them, just like the uh, staircase did. Um, black powder tamales. Okay, now that's what I've nicknamed them. That's not what they're called in the mining community. I, I've just given them that nickname because it's a fun nickname, because that's what they look like. They look like tamales, but Technically, what they're really called would be like um, a black powder charge or a black powder round. And uh, so what they would do is they have a piece of canvas about so, you know, so big, and they're going to sprinkle in a certain amount of powder depending on the rock type and what they're blasting. And then they roll it up like a burrito or a tamale, okay, um, after they put the fuse in, of course. Then they roll it up. Then after they get the hole drilled, they put that into the hole, and then they tamp it in all the way to the end of the hole, and then they backfill that hole with some type of uh, material, be it uh, sand or mud or clay, okay, and then light the fuse. Uh, the fuse is generally wax coated, so it can, it can withstand a little bit of water. The fuse burns in and then sets off the powder charge, and kaboom. Um, once we got past the tamales, in that upper little drift going off to that big stope. When I, remember when I reached down and I said, hey, look at this, it looks like a handle. And, and on camera, you see my hand reach and kind of flip it over. If you look closely, you'll see that that handle was wrapped with uh, a leather, think of it like a leather uh, lanyard. You know, like um, in the old days, you know, a cowboy would go into the mercantile snap off a, a, a leather lanyard and, uh, you know, put it on his pistol or gun like that. And then so, so that when he you know, does a quick draw, he doesn't fly off and lose it off your wrist or, or whatever. So that rope was wrapped with a leather, leather lanyard all the way around. But of course, it's all black and moldy and ugly looking. Um, and then when I was on my way back from that big stope, I pointed the camera at that rope. It's there's a good possibility that what you're looking at there was true blue hemp rope. Okay, uh, when I was up in that area, um, some of you guys were like, wow, we're seeing a lot of sparkling rocks and things of that nature. Um, what you're looking at there is a uh, large crystal barite. That's what was, uh, that's what was giving off those sparkles. And uh, as I was working my way through the mine, yeah, barite can have really large, you know, one inch, two inch, crystals in it and if the light hits it just right it's going to reflect similar to like you know mica um let's see what else do i have here oh you guys were asking me um so what were they what were they mining out of that giant open space well the bulk of it was um silver chloride contained in brecciated rock and then running in with that was um was sarogarite and uh, there was also uh, barite veins of barite also coming into the deposit but they weren't finding a lot of um, silver within the, the veins of barite that's when we when we were down in there you notice that the miners just weren't pulling that out of the mine there was veins of it all over the place real big ones too but primarily they were going after the silver chloride which was contained in, in brecciated rock Okay, and then as well as the sarogarite, which is the fancy term for horn silver. Um, 
Now, getting back up to that drift where I was finding the tamales, and then I looked off into that big stope and I said, holy crap, you know, like, look at how big this thing is. Well, after we looked down into that stope, when I worked my way down to the silver expanse shaft, cast the light over to the other side of the shaft and saw that bucket laying on its side as well as those wheels, I'm pretty darn certain that if you were to rope down the side of the wall into that big stope, it, that's exactly what it's going to do. If you went over, it would take you right straight over to where we saw that saw that station or that hole on the other side of that shaft where that ore buck is, is tipped on its side that's because that's at the exact same level yep uh, problem is is if uh, somebody were to to go up there and to try to rope down into that stope there's a good chance that they could damage all the tamales laying on the ground the hemp rope you know things of that nature because of course you know to rope down that you're gonna there's gonna be a lot of foot traffic through there to make that happen so um, damage could very well occur to all of those tamales um, oh the big tree yeah so uh, you were asking me how, how did they how did they get that big tree down there and how it was cut well back in the 1800s they used what were called two-man cross-cut saws you get one guy on each on each end and you saw the tree like this between two men. And that's how a big, a big tree like that was cut down or, or cut into that chunk was with a two-man cross-cut saw. After the log was cut, then they would put it into, they would either, they, they wouldn't put it into an ore bucket. More than likely, they would chain it and then attach that chain somehow and lower it down on a chain. And then a bunch of guys would strong arm it over into the drift, I'm guessing bring it in and then use it where wherever they needed it now the question is is why would they bring such a large tree into the mine um well that tells me that they're that they're they're trying to hold something up there's something that needs a brace and it needs a really really big brace so during operations in that part of the mine they obviously felt as though that there was a part of the, 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 the back of the mine or the hanging wall that needed a heavy brace on it. And so they brought that in and, and stuck it in there. But as time went by, they kept carving more and more and more of that area out. And then they no longer needed the brace. So they dropped it and set it off to the side over there. And that's where it remained. What I found surprising was that that big tree still had the bark on it. You would think that um, that would be, be kind of a hindrance. I mean, maybe, maybe not. I don't know. Uh, you, know you, you would think they would at least strip the bark off and have it just, you know, the, the bulk of the, of the wood there. But uh, I, that's what I, I found that kind of to be kind of interesting. Oh, excuse me. I'll take a drink of water here. Whew, this is a lot of talking. Hmm. Okay, um, oh, you guys were seeing um, things hanging off of the walls, and I, too, saw some of that when I was editing the episode. Um, there was uh, things that looked like hangers here and there, and I think what we're looking at is either uh, candle hangers that were sticking out of, uh, you know, drill holes that were put in place, and now they're all rusted, so it kind of looks just like a hook or a loop. Or they were hangers for oil lamp lanterns is possible too. Because remember now, this is 1875, between 1870 and 1875, we don't have carbide lamps and carbide lanterns. And that's why when I got down in there, guys, did you notice I didn't find any miners graffiti? No miners graffiti, no, no carbide lamp where they would take a carbide lamp and then, you know, write their name and things of that nature. I didn't find any of that down on those levels. And that's because they were operating by candlelight and oil lamp. Um, oh, slat rail and strap rail. Yeah, it's the same thing. Um, I know there's other mine explorers out there that are calling it... Uh, strap rail 
And yeah, technically that's what it is. I, I call it slat rail because it looks like, you know, metal slats. It's, it's the same thing. Um, but um, again, another clue is that we're so early in time on this mine that uh, they were not able to bring up actual rail. Right? So that's another clue as to how old this mine is. Actual rail was not used. They just dropped down 4 by 4s and put a slat on top or a strap on top, and that was good enough. Um, all right, now let's talk about the silver expanse shaft. This is where things get really interesting. Um, so first of all, we know that that shaft is 1,300 feet deep from the surface. 1,300 feet all the way down to the Silver Fortune Tunnel. Now, where I was, was roughly at the 250 to the 300 foot level. Okay. Now below, if you were to rope down in that, you're going to come into one and two more levels. And then all the way into the very, very bottom, you're eventually going to hit, hit the bottom or the backside of the Silver Fortune Tunnel. So, if somebody was bold enough and daring enough to rope further down that shaft, you could get into those two levels, but who knows how, how, how big they are. I don't have any maps showing the workings on those levels, so it's anybody's guess as to how big, big the workings could be. They could be as big as what we found. I, I doubt it. I doubt it. I think they're going to be smaller. You just don't know, but the one thing is an absolute certainty uh, nobody's ever been there in 150 whatever years. Uh, definitely a camera's never been down in there. There's a good chance that when, when you get deeper into the mines, um, going off of past knowledge, we always know that the deeper we go, the more artifacts you find because it's harder for those items to be recovered after the mine shuts down. A lot of times the miners just, you know, leave it there because it's too expensive and too much too laborious to try to pull it back out of the mine. They've already made their millions of dollars with the uh, with with what they found. At that point, it's like, you know, leave it. So there, you know, there it's going to lay. There could be there could be a bonanza of stuff down in there. There could be absolutely nothing. But um, to rope it, it would go something like this. Where I was, it was almost vertical. But then it starts to go at about an 80 degree incline. And as you get down to those other two levels, it eventually works its way to about a 70 degree incline. And then it goes back to an 80 degree incline before it drops into uh, the Silver Fortune Tunnel. So it's kind of like down, over, down, over again, and then down. It's not a straight shot all the way down. And when you're, low, when you're going down, and coming back up, the deeper that you go, the more danger it's going to become. Because if anything lets loose in that shaft from that distance, um, and it comes down at you at that velocity, velocity, you're going to get there's going to be damage if it hits you, no doubt about it. So there's the danger involved. Um, let's see what else was there now. Uh, oh, the this, the, 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 the pile of snow I found down in there. You know, there's a good possibility that that small snow field is, is over, well over 100 years old. Um, being since this mine sits at 9,000 feet in elevation, and uh, that, that, the top of that mountain just gets lots of snow in the wintertime, lots of blowing and drifting, and the, the blowing and drifting snow curls its way into the top of the shaft works its way down and then forms a pile right there at that first station. Years and years and years of that combined with the fact that that mine is is really chilly. You guys saw my breath when I was down in there. Um, yeah, it, it could be 100, 125. It could be as old as the mine when the mine shut down. Like a, like, a, like a little mini glacier, you know, think of it that way. Pretty, pretty cool. Well, that was about 
it. Those are the things I wanted to talk about um, that you may or may not have seen, and it also helps put some of the uh, the scenes in the video in, more into context. Now you can go back and rewatch it with this information, and uh, yeah, yeah, I just uh, this mine was over the top, absolutely over the top, and quite honestly, I don't know. I just don't know how I'm going to top it, guys. <laughs> I don't. How are you going to top this? I mean, I don't know. I guess I'll just keep trying. So, um, here's another thing I want to talk about. Yeah, I almost got hurt down in there. I sure did. Yeah, I had a close call. And uh, what it was, was um, after the cameras were all shut off, um, I was bringing the ladder back up out of that stope and you know, it's only 35 pounds. So I'm, I'm bringing it back up, bringing it back up, bringing it back up. And then when I finally get it onto that ledge, I sat it on the ground and I'm looking up and of course it's 20 feet tall. Right. And, uh, so I, I, I it's, it's, you know, free, free floating in the air. So I'm looking, I was like, well, I got, I got to lean this against something. So I kind of positioned it and I leaned it against the wall above me. And so then I reached down and I went shaking and the first thing, you know, like it's a telescopic ladder, so it went down, and then I pressed the next two plastic parts, and they went chink chink like that. Well, when I hit the third one, chink chink, I dislodged a rock above my head, not quite the size of a watermelon, and I didn't see it come down. And all I did is I just I, I just heard it. I mean, I saw it go right past my my head, like about three feet away. And foomp, it hit my backpack. Let me show you this. I wasn't wearing my backpack when I was doing this. Right here. It put a hole. <laughs> it put a hole clean through, clean through my backpack right there. Yep. And it put a hole clean through the water bladder right here. Yeah. So can you imagine? Oh, and it snapped my feeder tube here. Just completely destroyed it. Yeah. So thank goodness. Uh, thank goodness the angels were looking over me that day because if that rock would have hit me in the noggin, oh yeah, it would have been just, I, I'd have been knocked out. It would have been bad news, bad news. So in the future, um, what do we got here? Oh yeah, guys, you've been saying you should get a drone and fly a drone around in there. Well, here's the problem with that. A lot of today's modern drones need a GPS, proper GPS signal to work. Unless of course you have some of the new um, FPV drones, those you can fly indoors. Um, but here's the problem. So you have a drone, but you have no lighting. You got to have some kind of light, and th those drones can only carry so much of a payload for forward for forward lighting. So to fly a drone in there would be really tricky. And if you get it into a spot, it only takes one nick, one second. You've guys seen the videos. One little like that, and your hundred dollar or thousand dollar drone is falling down into the bottom of who knows where more than likely not going to be recoverable. So um, you, you better be really careful because you just, you, you're, you're out a thousand some odd dollars in a heartbeat if that drone falls all the way down a shaft or in a stope or something like that. So no, you just can't use drones in these uh, locations because they, for that reason, as well as not being able to carry a light, a light payload. Now maybe, maybe what you could do is use an FPG, FPV drone and put an IR, an infrared um, type camera on the, on the front of it. That's a possibility, but you know. Uh, what I would like to see is someone go down into that mine with a really nice long exposure camera setup. You, got, you guys know, you've seen it where they take photos in um, large um, cave systems like Mammoth Cave or Carlsbad, etc. They go in there, they set the, set the lights up in behind so you have a lot of indirect lighting. And then they'll set up a camera on a tripod and take a long exposure shot so that you can capture 
uh, the whole room. That would be really cool if somebody did that. Um, the other question was, guys, you wanted me to run my torpedo down the shaft, down the Silver Expanse shaft. With that shaft, you can't do it. The torpedo is designed in such a way it has to dro drop perfectly vertical in a vertical shaft without touching the sides. If it touches the sides, it could get snagged on something. And then when it comes time to pull it back up, uh-oh, uh-oh, now you got a problem, you know. That torpedo cam is about fifteen, eighteen hundred dollars $1,800 altogether with all the parts. And uh, if you were to drop it down the expanse shaft, it's going to go down, it's going to hit, it's going to, because it's like I said, it's on an incline, so it's going to hit and then bounce its way, bounce its way. And there's all kinds of different things down there it could, it could get hung up on. So, um, no, that, that wouldn't work. All right. And uh, I got to take a drink of water here. Blah, blah, blah. Boy, lots to talk about. Mm. All right future collaboration for this mine well let's talk about that we're pretty much uh going through part one of the series all the way to part six for the most part i've explored i'm going to say probably 70 to 80 percent of that mine of course that we didn't get down into that that's that one big stope and of course we didn't go down the shaft so if you were to have a collaboration, that would be the goal. The goal would be to have a bunch of people with you that could bring in some equipment, put in some more rock anchors, and then go down that shaft and try to get to those levels. Now, you could do that um, a couple of ways. Put in anchors, as I said. You could go all the way outside, top side, put a heavy object on the end of a climbing rope, tie it off, drop it down in there and bounce or draw the draw the line all the way down the shaft so that when you go back down in the mine and go over to that station here you have your climbing rope hanging down then you would just need to reach out with a big stick or something pull it into you then you could you know snap on it's going to be tied outside and then you could swing over to that drift and get in it like that and then, uh, so, so that would be your anchor. You could do it that way. But all of these things would need, be, need to be discussed uh, well ahead of time to put together a collaboration, um, you know, with, you know, qualified people that would, would really be, have a lot of fun with, the, with this and be interested in it. You know, like Jeff Williams, you know, like Justin from TVR or Frank. And uh, some of you guys down in the comments section, oh gosh, gee whiz, don't invite Frank he'll steal everything and put it in his museum <laughs> guys <laughs> first of all let me explain to you Frank and I are friends and just like friends do we agree on a lot of things and we disagree on a lot of things that's all part of a friendship so even though we disagree on uh, artifacts and things of that nature we agree on a lot of other things and you know oh he's a generally a, ni a really nice guy we hang out it's 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 always a good experience but we just have a few disagreements in a few areas that's so that doesn't mean you're just going to put his you know put him on the chopping block that doesn't make any sense but honestly let's let's look at this for example there's no way you're going to pull these artifacts out of this mine they're too big they're too fragile and there's way too many obstacles that you would have to uh, negotiate to get them out of the mine, all you got to do is go back and watch part parts two, three, four, five. Go back and do that, and put pencil to paper and mark off all of the obstacles <laughs> that you would have to overcome to get those things out of that mine. I mean, what are you going to do? Throw a three, four hundred pound ore bucket over your shoulder and cross Spinebreaker Bridge? <laughs> no. You know, uh, hire someone with a gin pole truck outside, drop a cable down the main shaft and wiggle it over there and try to pull. No, put 50 to 100 pounds of wheels in your backpack and try to hike them out. No, it's just, it's just, it's just silly talk. And besides, guys, when it, get, when it comes right down to it, the artifacts that I found down in there, they already exist in museums across this country. It's so much better just to leave them right where they are. 
They're perfectly happy within the context of their surroundings. You know, think about that. If you pull them out of there and they're just sitting in the corner of a room in a museum, they're out of context. But how I found them down in the mine, it's perfect. That, I mean, that's their environment. That's their home. That's their context. Just, just leave it be. Don't do anything with it so that when the next explorer goes down into that mine, he or she too can get all excited and crazy as I did over what, over what they're finding. So how does the silver expanse shaft connect into the silver fortune tunnel, you ask? Okay, as I was saying earlier, uh, the silver expanse shaft is 1300 feet, comes into the silver fortune tunnel, but here's the problem. There's a, there's a giant area of fault gouge, um, roughly 3,000 feet in to the, uh, Silver, the Silver Fortune Tunnel. It's made out of uh, clay and real soft material that has uh, fallen down from a fault and pinched off, pinched off the uh, haulage at it. Now, if you were to get past that, it continues on another thousand feet before it finally connects connects with the silver expanse shaft going going up. Now, more than likely, because that giant clay plug from the fault gouge is in place down there, there could be 50, even 100 feet of standing water in behind that plug. And if you were to go into the Silver Fortune tunnel, tunnel and try to dig that out, <laughs> You could very well find yourself on the leading end, edge of a giant flush. Uh, basically, what would happen is, is uh, you know the log ride at Six Flags Great America? <laughs> well, you could be the log, um, depending on how much water is, is behind that plug. But let's just, you know, brainstorm here for a moment. If you were to excavate out that plug and dewater the mine, you very well could travel that additional thousand feet and get into the bottomest most workings or lowest workings of the silver expanse shaft. That would be pretty darn, pretty darn cool, but quite the undertaking. Yeah. Um, let's see what else we have here. Uh, okay, well, we're starting to kind of wrap up here, except for the Q&A at the end. Um, so what is the future of mine exploration, you ask? <sighs> Going into the winter exploring season. Well, like I was saying, this one is going to be hard to top, but there's still a lot of mines out there that are, you know, interesting and they have interesting geology and their layout is interesting. Now, of course, you're never going to find a, a bonanza of artifacts like we found in this one all the time. I mean, that's, you know, that's kind of difficult to do. But there's still a lot of interesting aspects about abandoned mines when you take into consideration their layout, the geology, um, the graffiti in there. Um, it's, it's not really anything that we haven't seen before. But you never know. Um, each and every abandoned mine is kind of like a snowflake. There, there's no two that are the same. And uh, every single adventure and every single explore plays out differently. So with that being said, there is some... The region of Arizona that I'm going to be traveling to has a lot of large lead mines. And um, Mr. M and I spent... A little bit of time on those lead lead mines as i recall we documented one or two they were pretty darn cool when him and i were working together and i always wanted to get back into that area and see what else i could find i know that there's more there and there's some really really big ones with just giant giant stopes and giant bulb rooms i thought that would be really really cool um so that's going to be just one of many areas i'm going to be focusing on this coming winter um yeah, uh, so the YouTube platform. Well, yeah, let's talk about that for example, for, for a moment. Right now, YouTube, the platform is, I'm just going to use the word difficult. 
When us creators were uh, making videos during peak COVID, everything was grand. Everything was wonderful. That's because everybody was in lockdown. They were at home. They were watching YouTube videos, uh, etc. But right now, the, pretty much the bottom has completely dropped out of the platform. And that's why I'm so happy that you guys uh, have considered, you know, putting in donations in the, in the tip jar because the ad, ref, ad revenue for all of us creators <laughs> has just went... <laughs> You know, I mean, I'm telling you, it's 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 bad. It's bad, and and everybody's complaining about it across the entire platform, and that's because of the uh, recession and the economy and everything that's going on. The advertisers just aren't buying big blocks of ads and putting them on videos like they were doing during peak COVID, and so everything has taken a drastic downturn right now. But it is what it is. These are the hills and valleys that you that you endure when you're, you know, doing anything from a, like a, let's say a business standpoint, you know. Um there's some things about the YouTube platform that really bother the heck out of me. There's absolutely no way of knowing how the how the algorithm works. It's basically you're working for a machine. It's all AI. There's really nobody in the background pushing buttons. And making decisions and things of that nature, unless unless you're doing something on your site that that will event that will involve an actual human to go, uh, uh, you can't be doing that or saying that and so on and so forth, and then they press a few buttons and something happens. But if you're operating a channel like I do, you're pretty much working for a machine. You're feeding the algorithm. You're feeding the AI and uh, things are just bobbing and weaving along. And what it all boils down to, in my three and a half years experience on YouTube, you can produce the most outstanding video you've ever produced in your entire life. You can put in a 90 hour edit, okay? It doesn't, doesn't matter because what it all boils down to is the thumbnail and the title. If you don't have a good thumbnail and title, people will just, just right, I mean, that that's it now of course you have to have good content because you want people to keep watching longer it, you know you want them to, you want to keep your audience engaged and that's why you need to do it be doing your best to produce good content to keep everybody engaged so that they're watching past you know 15 20 minutes etc if you don't have good content well then people are just clicking off after the first five or ten minutes but ultimately if you want to play on the YouTube platform, that thumbnail and that title is of the absolute utmost importance. Um, one of the things I want to jump into maybe this winter, I really, really want to start working, get, get working on my other YouTube channel called Adventure Coolness. I've been putting that off and putting that off. And uh, it's only because I've just been putting so much attention and devotion into my primary channel. Um, Adventure coolness is going to be an, a, a completely different animal. And uh, if you guys feel like going over there right now, and even though there's no content, just you know, head over there and hitting the subscribe button so that when that day comes, you're all good to go. Uh, but I would like to start focusing a little bit on, on that, if, if at all possible, this winter. That would be a lot of fun. Well, guys, this is uh, this has been a lot of fun. I hope you learned a little bit today. So I'm going to be taking a break. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm going to be stepping away for a little while because I'm going to be spending some time uh, with a with a friend I haven't seen for like five or six years, um, and that's going to be good to kind of get caught up. And then when I get back from that. I am going to uh, have to tidy up around my RV, get everything ready to go, because uh, at the end of the month I'm headed back down to Arizona, and then of course I gotta, you know, tear everything down, set everything back up again, get 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 situated, and then once I am, I can get back out in the field and and start documenting new sites. And all of this is a process. Um, yeah, so uh, that's 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 what I have planned. So you probably won't be seeing new content on the channel. Mm, let's just say it'll be roughly like say this the end of the second week of October. This is the time of the year 
that I really like to get out and do other things other than mine exploring. I love September and early October. Um, in some parts of the country, the temperatures are starting to come down and uh, it's just a, a nice time of the year to go out and, and, and do other things. And not only that, but um, this is the time of the year when a lot of the uh, uh, wildfires begin to occur, blowing a lot of smoke across Nevada and smoky and hazy skies just don't make optimal conditions for drone footage. It, it just doesn't. And then the other thing is in September, you got a lot of hunters running around in the mountains. Um, they're hunting through September in the first part of October or through October. So you, when you're out mine exploring, you get a lot of run-ins. You get a lot of people that are, you know, on side-by-sides, you know, driving up and all of a sudden they see a Jeep, a Jeep in the middle of nowhere and they're like, why is this Jeep in the middle of nowhere? And it's just human nature to automatically think that the worst has occurred, especially when you see a vehicle in the middle of nowhere. And uh, yes, it has happened on two occasions where after I got back from a mine explorer, as soon as I get into cell phone range, there's a voicemail on my phone and it's like, what is this? So he listened to it it's like, yeah, this is the uh, something something uh, sheriff's department of this county. Uh, we've received a report that your vehicle may have been abandoned. Could you please call us right away? You know, in all these instructions. So you got to call them back and explain to them, you know, because what it, what it was was a good Samaritan. I'm not saying they're doing anything wrong, but people, that, you know, they see a vehicle, they, they, they call in the license plate, and then that's the procedure. So with so many people running around in the hills doing their hunting activities this time of the year, that's another reason why... Um, it's a perfect time of the year just to go do something else. Well, guys, I'm going to, this is a perfect jumping off point. Um, yeah, it, uh, from here, I'm going to go into Q and a, a lot of you have probably already know the answers to a lot of the questions that we're going to cover. But from this point forward in the video, we're going to jump into Q and a, if you're interested in that sort of thing, if you're, if you're a new subscriber and you want to know more about me and more about the channel, uh, things of that nature. Well, hang in there um, because we're going to do a whole lot more blah, blah, blah. But for all of you that just were kind of here to see it for, for the end of the season recap, that's going to about do it. Um, yeah, thank you so much. I'm really happy that you enjoyed this season. I had as much fun uh, making it as you guys had fun watching it. And I really hope that I can take it to a lot more cool and interesting places. So guys, uh, Thanks for coming along and being so supportive to the channel. I really appreciate it. And I'll see you down in Arizona after I get settled in. All right, take care, guys. Now, on to Q&A. Well, all right, guys, welcome to Q&A. Yeah, see, I told you there's going to be a whole lot of blah, blah, blah in this video. But hey, you know, some of you guys are new to the channel. Um, so I'm just going to kind of go through a few questions. I Basically, what I did is over the last year or so, I've been compiling um, a list of questions that comes directly from the comment section, and I put them into question form, and uh, I wanted to do this on a live show. Um, I don't quite have that ability yet, so we're just going to go down through that list right now, and I'm going to do my best to try to answer some of your questions uh, that you've had for me over the last, uh, yeah, the last couple of years. All right, first one, yeah. Who is Gly? Well, that's me. <laughs> okay, so Gly, Gly is my nickname. That nickname was given to me in the early 2000s when I used to build super fast liquid cooled gaming computers and I would compete using software called 3D Mark and uh, I would compete online with my friends from all over the world and trying to get the best score, the fastest frame rates, et cetera, et cetera. Now, these were back in the days when liquid-cooled PCs were pretty much made out of um, aquarium parts and plumbing parts and things of that nature. Now, uh, the guys at MIT, of course, they were in a class all to themselves because I don't have liquid nitrogen to cool my processors. So the, the class that I would compete in is true blue liquid glycol coolant computers. So one day, one of my online friends 
started calling me Gly because of gl uh, ethylene glycol. Okay, ethylene glycol is like radiator fluid or you know coolant. So he took the Gly from glycol and started calling me Gly Coolness, and the name just stuck. And I've just uh, people have been calling me Gly ever since. So that's where the name comes from. What's my real name? Well, I'm not going to tell you because uh, I was, uh, well, let me think here. Yeah, I was the guy that helped uh, D.B. Cooper put on his parachute, so it's probably best we're not on a first name basis. Um, <laughs> okay, where were you born and where did you grow up? I was born in, in Wisconsin. Uh, I grew up just outside of Milwaukee, Wisconsin until I was 12 years old. And then um, when I was, yeah, when I was 12, my dad, my brother, and I moved to Wyoming, and I lived there ever since in uh, Fremont County, Wyoming. I spent over 30 years there, and that's where I cut my teeth on abandoned mine exploration, cave exploration, all kinds of outdoor activities. It was a fantastic, I had a great, great teenage, teenage life. It was, it was just awesome. What was your career prior to YouTube and cancer? Long before I was doing YouTube videos, my career was, um, I was in the explosives business, primarily 1.3G professional display fireworks, and my job was mostly fireworks regulatory. That's what I spent the most of my time on, was, was uh, uh, explosives regulatory, inventory management, uh, DOT regulatory that had anything and everything per to do pertaining to explosives. Uh, out on the highways, um, all of that stuff. That, that's what I did. And uh, so when it comes to explosives regulatory, yeah, I'm your guy. I, I should probably be doing consulting, but I just, I'm, I'm trying to act semi-retired. <laughs> um, uh, let's see here. Oh, here's a good one. Tell us a little bit more about your personality off camera. Well, I'm pretty much just kind of the guy you see right now, except uh, there's a whole lot more yucks. There's a whole lot more rib jabbing. I do like, um, I do like, I, I do like tongue-in-cheek humor. Um, so if you're out bumping around with me out in the hills, there's going to be a lot of tongue-in-cheek kind of humor. Now, I don't know if you guys noticed, but I incorporate a lot of that down in the comments section. So guys, don't ever take me too seriously. Seven times out of ten, down in the comment section, there's a certain degree of tongue-in-cheek going along with, with my comments back to you guys. And that's because, you know, I'm a light-hearted kind of a guy, you know, unless you attack me directly or really rub my feathers in the wrong direction. Um, but I'm a pretty easygoing guy, and uh, I just, I, you know, I want to I interact with you down in the comment section in a fun way. Kind of like how I would interact with you if you were here sitting alongside with me here in old Bob, bouncing down the trail. Are you single? Yes, yes I am. <laughs> How did you get into mine exploring? Well, as I was saying earlier, um, once my brother and I were, we moved to Wyoming, uh, there were so many cool places to explore that, uh, I mean, there was just abandoned mines all over the place. This was prior to the Clinton administration, before everything was sealed up or bulldozed and whatnot. Um, all of the abandoned mines were open, and uh, I was out there every weekend, every other weekend, crawling in every hole that I could possibly find. And once I got kind of bored with that, then I started climbing, climbing in uh, black bear dens, um, that was a lot of fun, and then of course I went through my uh, cave exploring phase. Uh, every single cave that I could find in the Fremont County area, you know, I've been in them, almost all of them. There's a few out there I haven't, uh, but a lot of them I have, and they're, they're, they're pretty darn cool. So I lived a lifestyle, very outdoorsy, um, hunter, fisher, fisherman. Um, yeah, I mean, every weekend I was out in the hills. Uh, particularly the uh, the uh, south end of the Wind River Range is where I played. Um, how does that say here? Get my <laughs> spectacles on here. Um, oh, do you have a degree in geology? No, I do not. 
No, I don't have a formal degree, never went to college or anything like that, but I've had a love of geology ever since I was six years old when my mother handed me this book, uh, very well illustrated, had all these really cool pictures of rock layers and things like things of that nature. And ever since then, I mean, that was the seed. That That's all it took. And I've had an interest ever since. So I'm always trying to gobble up as much information as I possibly can and learn as much as I can about, about geology. Um, I certainly don't operate on a level like uh, like Jeff Williams does, for example. I mean, his the way his brain works and, and how he's able to retain the uh, terminology and things like that is just absolutely incredible. But, but that's because he went to school and studied and, and did all that it took to, uh, to get his degree. Um, and that's why he's able to, you know, talk fluently as he does when he starts talking about ge geology. I can't quite raise to that level, but I certainly do know a lot and uh, I'm able to incorporate that a lot of that into the show, uh, which makes which makes the channel, you know, that much more interesting. Um, oh, okay, here. What do you love most about abandoned mine exploration? <sighs> the mystery of it. You never know what's around the next corner, or down the next incline shaft, or up or down the next. Uh, cracky ladder you know every twist and every turn could behold something really cool whether it's an artifact or uh, something that has to do with geology um pretty much for me anyways abandoned mines are like time capsules they're a, they're time capsules that you can walk into and explore it, it's it's really cool uh what do you oh let me see here what do you dislike most about abandoned mine exploration? Trash and uh, how people trash up abandoned mines. It's just, it's just despicable. <sighs> Guys, I mean, you just wouldn't believe. The things that I have seen over the years, I just don't understand it. I don't understand the mentality behind why people just have to always destroy Destroy, destroy, destroy. I mean, I just don't understand it. You know, if, if they see something, they have to destroy it or deface it or trash it up. Um, it's it's part of the human, part of human nature, I suppose. But there's some areas of the country where you see it more than others. Um, I, I, but I've, I've seen the whole, you know, gamut of, of uh, trashed up and spray painted up abandoned mine it's just terrible because it, basically it boils down to you are defacing our, our mining history you're destroying our mining history so um stop it please don't do that no more um there's only so much left and with the blm and the forest service closing off mines at a record pace it's not getting any better so um yeah please don't do that to abandoned mines that's what i dislike the most about it it really rubs me the wrong way um what do you love and hate most about youtube <laughs> off the cuff comments no that wouldn't be it uh no I, um as i was saying earlier in this video youtube is a kind of an interesting platform but it's um it, it's it's kind of surrounded by one aspect. YouTube wants you to keep clicking videos, keep clicking videos. Go to the next one, watch it. Go to the next one, watch it. Go to the next one, watch it. That's that's what it's all about, so that you, you keep getting hit with an ad. Uh, and then you watch another video, and then you get hit with another ad. And so what it boils down to is um, you got to have a good thumbnail and title. That's it. So that it, within that that first second or two when you're when they're when your eyeball hits the screen on your ipad or your phone and that thumbnail that title kind of jumps out at you within that second you touch it and that's how you have to formulate your 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 content you know you could produce great content it could just be outstandingly wonderful you know um but right up front you know that thumbnail and that title is your billboard and if it's not perfect People will just scroll right on by. Um, you'll get less views, less viewer retention. 
Uh, well, not, well, you get less viewer retention if the content within the video isn't very interesting. Um, that's why you got to strive to produce good content, you know, so that your your viewer retention stays and goes past 15 minutes if at all possible. But other than that, I like I like the things that YouTube has done over the past year and a half. Um, they've made some changes here and there to kind of help us help out us cr creators, but. You know, um, it's you. You just have to work around those specifics. That's the nature of the beast, and that's what you have to work around. This is not the Discovery Channel. This isn't the History Channel. It, it it's it's just it's it's YouTube. It's the nature of the beast. Um. Oh, <laughs> what happened to Mr. M and Randy? Okay, guys. Now I'm gonna answer this question. And by golly, I hope it's the last time that I ever see it in the comment section because, you know, we haven't worked with, the three of us haven't worked together in, what, 10 months? Roughly? Um, but yet there's still comments in the comment section, what happened to Mr. M? What happened to Randy? And it's like, and I, and I understand. I mean, I, because what's happening is newer subscribers, such as yourself, are going back and you're watching some of my older videos where Mr. M and I were working together. And then when you fast forward to what you're seeing now, well, all of a sudden he's gone. Well, um, I've tried to explain this in the past and I'll do it again. My channel basically plays out like a soap opera, okay? You gotta watch um, from week to week to week to week to week to week in order like that so that it, 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 it makes more sense because the channel evolves as we move forward. New ideas come, new ideas go, new people are introduced, new, you know, those people leave. It's like an ever, it's like a soap opera playing out over a period of time. But if you're jumping all over the place, looking at this, that, this, that video, then every, everything gets thrown out of context. And that's why a lot of times people are seeing me working with this Mr. M, then they jump forward to a new video, he's no longer around. You go down to the comment section, you say, what happened to Mr. M and Randy? So, okay, so ultimately here's what happened. Well, so um, the three of us working together, was it was never meant to be a, a long-term affair. When I first rolled into Goldfield RV, um, I got to know Mr. M or Scott. And then shortly after that, I got to know Randy. And, uh, you know, we'd hang out by the fire together. And eventually that turned into, hey, you want to come along with me on some mine explorers? And then from that, it turned into uh, Mr. M offering ideas about, uh, how would you put it, uh, banter back and forth between us and, and banter within the minds and uh, things of that nature. And I told him, I said, well, you know, that's kind of a, that's a pretty get, big, big course correction for the channel to go that direction. But I'm willing to give it a try. You know what the heck? Let's uh, let let's see what happens. So we got a whole bunch of cameras so that we could do about a lot of a lot of in cab and things of that nature. Okay, and it was a lot of fun, no doubt. I mean, working working with those two was an absolute hoot at times. You know, um, sometimes we would get grumpy with each other, especially on hot days. You know, like you know anybody would, um, but. There, there was never anything like, you know, the reason that we'd stopped working with each other wasn't because there was um, disputes within, you know, not getting money or, or more, notori no, more, more or less notoriety. And no, it was, it was none of that. Mr. M eventually, you know, he was dealing with some health issues and it, it, it's really not my place to, to talk about that to you guys. If, if you want to learn about that, you got to go directly to him or go to his channel. I, that's that's not my place to talk about, but he was dealing with some health issues, and uh, he also had some things that he had to um, button up in Oregon with his house. He was um, working on expanding his RV park, um, and to this very day, those th those same things are still happening. He's you know working on expanding his his park. He's, uh, uh, Randy is still camp host there. So by all means, guys, if you're, if you're traveling between Reno and Las Vegas, pull into Goldfield RV. Randy's a great guy. He'll, he'll point you in the right direction. And so you can pull into the right spot, you know, and that's all it was. 
So our lives just kind of went, um, we just kind of separated like that. You know, the other aspect of it is, is, you know, I'm always bouncing around and um, Mr. M was able to, you know, follow me, follow me around in his RV, but, you know, Randy was unable to do that and, and still is to this very day. So it's not like I'm located in one location of Nevada and we're always together all the time. Oh no, I'm, I'm here, there, I'm everywhere. And uh, logistically speaking, it's just not feasible for the three of us to always be together and always doing that. It's just, it's just not. There's, there's costs involved. There's things going on in our lives, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, that's it. That's all it boils down to. There, I, I wish there was more drama. You know, I wish there was, but there's not. <laughs> We're all still friends. We all still talk to each other. Every now and then, um, I'll have a nice chat with Mr. M on the phone. Um, every now and then, I'll get a text from Randy. It's uh. Yeah, that's just where we're at. So in the future, if we, if 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 we're on the same trail and our trails happen to merge, you know, we'll hang out and or, or and do a do a collab or something like that. But uh, that's basically what it boils down to, guys. There's it, there's nothing more to it than that. Um. Oh, what happened to the schnozzleator? <laughs> well, as with all of my ideas in the channel, you know, you, you put things out in front of you to, to keep everything fresh. You know, you, you don't want to become a you know, cookie cutter um, like so many channels are. I don't want to become cookie, cookie cutter. I really don't want to become, I don't want my channel to be predictable. So I try to keep putting interesting things out there that I'm going to try like, you know, like the schnozzleator, like uh, recently it was maps. Um, always something new on the horizon. Well, with the schnozzleator, that thing worked out absolutely great. After we finally got it refined down to the, the very last shaft that I used it for to drop into, um, it was working just absolutely perfect. But there's one problem with it. When you got a guy all the way in the bottom, and, uh, and it's time to pull him back up, the guy up top is using the winch on the Jeep with a progressive capture and he's pulling you in 10 to 15 foot increments back up the mine, okay? Now, why is he doing this, you ask? Because me, I don't have the upper body strength to be able to use an ascender and everything else and climb vertically up and, up and down vertical shafts. I just don't. You know, you have to operate within the confines of your abilities and I do not have the upper body strength to do that, do that any longer. So the next best option was to create the schnoz, which would dangle the, the stinger over the top of the shaft so that the rope wouldn't hit the sides, knocking debris on top of the person that's on the rope. Okay, but when you're coming back up, he's pulling you with that 10, 15 ton winch. Now, if any part of your body gets snagged, they're going to rip your foot right off. You're going to rip your leg right off. Okay, Un unless, uh, now, now even, now think about this. Even if you have really good communications, okay, it only takes a heartbeat for that person to hit the switch on the winch button. And if in that very moment, if you get a boot caught or something hung up, whatever, whatever the case may be, that 10 ton winch is unforgiving. It will rip your foot off of your leg like that, and you are not going to have enough time to scream over the radio, be it wireless or with repeaters or with it being hard-lined. It don't matter. You're not going to have enough time to go, stop, 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 because by that time your foot's coming off, and um, you're going to be doing more screaming than you're going to be doing saying stop. And so because of this fact, it was really giving Mr. M a lot of anxiety topside and I don't blame him one bit. So right now the schnozzleator is in storage and I told him I said well here's what I'm going to do I'm going to wait until the channel um, grows even more and gets even larger until finally the channel can afford a battery powered ascender. They make them in Europe. Um, the problem is is they're, they're, they're $21,000. They have to be that expensive because 
you, you've got your life on the thing. It needs to be, it needs to work flawlessly, but they're incredibly expensive. But the thing about it is, is that if you were to have something like that, it puts the climber in command of his own actions coming back up the rope. And then you don't have to worry about an accident, like getting your foot ripped off or something like that. So, so that's the story of the schnoz and that's why it's in storage for right now. Um, what happened? Well, I can't read that. Sorry, guys. What happened to the Kenny Veach exploration? Okay, well, I pretty much lined that out in the um, in the community under the community tab on my channel's homepage. I don't want to get too lengthy into this, but what happened with the Kenny Veach exploration is is last winter when this Jeep was in the shop and they were putting the lift kit on it, what was supposed to take only two, maybe three weeks, turned out to take about a month and a half. And as that time was being, now this is March, okay, so I was hoping to have it done by, by mid-March because it was it, in that area where Kenny Beach went missing, it was still cool. But eventually it pushed out further and further and, he, and, and we got into the first part of April I wanted to do the Kenny Veach Explore before the big collaboration with Jeff Williams and everybody else. And everything just started getting scrunched and scrunched and scrunched and scrunched, all because of the huge delay of um, the folks at Summit working on the Jeep. It's not their fault. I mean, I, I totally understand where they were coming from uh, and why the delay occurred. But that's what happened. And as, I, as we pushed more, to, more towards April... It just got too hot out there. I did take a stab at it, but when we got out there, the, the terrain the terrain was too rough for uh, Mr. Carson's vehicle. And, uh, and it was really hot, and there was just, it was like, we're just going to have to put this off. Uh, I, didn't, I didn't want him to tear up his vehicle. I didn't want the both of us to be overcome with, you know, get, get overheated. It was getting really hot. So I said, no this is just too unsafe so i'm gonna be i'm gonna be putting that off until this coming winter and it's 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 something i would like to produce for my channel adventure coolness so if you're not subscribed go to adventure coolness hit the subscribe button so that you're ready for it but i think the kenny beach exploration is more appropriate for adventure coolness than it is for abandoned and forgotten places all right, why do you prefer solo exploring? Well, if I'm out running around um, doing something out in the hills, trail riding and such, I always prefer to have another person with me because it's just so much more fun to share the experience, you know. But when I get down into these abandoned mines, um, how can I explain this? I've always been a real mother hen by nature okay when um when i get into a, a a dangerous situation or a dangerous environment i oftentimes spend more of my time keeping an eye on the people that i'm with okay rather than myself and so when i've got other people with me in these places now gotta understand what we're doing here we're not just going for a walk in the mall. These are abandoned mines. They contain a host of all different kinds of dangers. And it's one thing to go in it alone where you can concentrate on you and yourself, where you have a bunch of people in there, and now all of a sudden the, the, the chances of something happening are, are, are going up. Not, I would say, exponentially would be kind of a big word to use, but the, the chances are increasing that more and more things could potentially happen with the more people that you put into an, an abandoned mine. And so with me, like I was saying, being mother hen, I get into these places and I'm trying to focus on, you know, camera shots, camera angles, lighting, uh, make sure all the equipment's working. Uh, then once everything's up and rolling, uh, maintaining good dialogue. I mean, there's I'm telling you, up here, it's a spaghetti. It's it, it's a, a spaghetti bowl going on. I'm pretty much orchestrating myself the best that I possibly can as we 
move our way through this space, putting the camera first, putting the audience first, okay, and making sure that everything is absolutely perfect so that you're, 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 you're getting good, good content. But when you get other people with you, the, dyna the, 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 the dynamic completely changes. And there's, there, there's uh, talking and chattering, and um, you're, you may have somebody that could be leaning up against an old stall, which is holding up gosh knows how many tons of rock. Um, in the past, some of the biggest problems I had was, was um, people would, as they're walking through the mine, how can I explain this? All right, here, here was my explanation. Guys, when we're in the mine, you have to treat it like the game operation. You know the game where you took the tweezers and you're trying to pull out the funny bone and you can't touch the sides? When you're in an abandoned mine, especially one with a lot of timbers, a lot of stalls, and a lot of support structure, you've you got to treat it like you're playing a game of operation. You can't touch anything. But as we get older, our our balance isn't as good as what it used to. We have a tendency to like use our hands and, and, and brace ourselves up against things. So I, I saw a lot of that going on and it was really, it was, just, it was just, just driving me crazy because any one of those old rotten hundred some odd year old timbers could be holding up gosh knows how much rock. And I mean, uh, uh, so with that being said, when I'm in there by myself, I can, I, I can control everything that's going on right around me, like in a bubble. But when you have multiple people in there, it just becomes very difficult for me. I'm always very concerned that someone else is going to get hurt. Uh, and that's why I prefer to do this solo in these places. Uh, but when we're out and about and doing this kind of stuff, you know, running out in the hills and trail riding and looking at old ghost towns or ruined structures, things of that nature, no, then, then having a companion with you where you can talk back and forth with banter, that's great. But inside the mines, it's a completely different dynamic. Um, have you ever been in a mine during an earthquake? No, never. I've been outside of a mine during earthquakes, but never in a mine during an earthquake. Have you ever gotten hurt in a mine? Uh, besides bumps and bruises and uh, thorns stuck in my hands from from Choya Cactus, no, never been hurt. Uh, had a close call with that watermelon-sized rock in the Thunder Ridge mine that I explained earlier. That was probably the closest call I've ever had since I started my YouTube channel. Back in the early 90s, um, I had a collar giveaway on me. Thank goodness it, it gave way underneath me and fell into this vertical shaft up in Montana. That was a close call. Uh, I'm glad I wasn't underneath that. I, well, I wouldn't be talking to you right now if I was. Yeah, I was coming back up a set of old ladders and uh, down below me that board kicked out and it just started a cascading event and the whole collar went whoom, and took out the landing, took out the ladders, took out the whole collar. A massive rush of debris fell into the shaft and then when it hit bottom, it billowed back up. Oh my gosh, my, my friends were freaking out. But by that, in those two, three seconds, I crawled out and jumped over the lip of the shaft. Uh, it was a close one. Yeah, mom, I never told you that story. <laughs> um, uh, have you ever encountered poor, poor air quality? Yeah, on occasion I have, but it's not very often. It all depends on the mine and it depends on how deep you are in the mine. Um, generally, I encounter it around a lot of uh, rotted wood material in, in a closed, confined space or a lot of uh, rusted steel in a closed, confined space. Um, that's where it generally occurs, and that's where I've ran into it in the past. But the occurrence of it has been very rare. you got to get really, really deep into abandoned mines where... Um, you start you start encountering bad air. Like for example, uh, the Thunder Ridge mine. When I was down in there, you you heard all of my huffing and puffing. My gosh, I sounded like a crazy steam engine 
in that mine. And that's because the mine sat at 9,000 feet in elevation and at the 250 to 300 foot level, it was probably right above 19.5 in on 20% oxygen. It wasn't 21% like we're breathing right now. The air down in there was like a tomb. It was stale, it wasn't fresh. Combine that with high altitude and you're gonna huff and puff like a steam engine. If you were to go deeper down into that shaft all the way to the Silver Fortune Tunnel, um, you may have a problem. There may not be enough air down there. Have you ever seen a ghost or had a ghostly experience? No, never. But I did have, at the time, what I thought could have been a ghostly experience. I don't quite remember the episode. It was the one where uh, I was lowered down with the schnozzlator. I got down in there. I felt something hit my hit my back or touch my lower back. Um, it just, it really felt like it. It felt like somebody just went, nope, you're not going any further and just, you know, like that. But after that, after that episode and after I got done ex talking about it in, a, in an episode thereafter, I, th I thought about that for weeks and weeks and weeks, if not months, you know, and I do believe that I, I think I am, I probably imagined it. And they, they say that your, your brain can imagine things in really high stress environments. And that was definitely a high stress, high anxiety environment. There was caliche crumbling down all over the place inside that mine. Um, the whole morning setting up the schnozzle later in those hot temperatures, we couldn't drink enough water to save our lives. And then we got it all set up. We didn't want to leave it overnight. So it was like, no, let's do this get online. By the time I got down into the mine, I was so exhausted, so already so tired. And then once I got a good look at the conditions of the mine, it was like, oh my gosh, this, this place is a slice of hell, um, just collapsing all over the place. And so I started kind of nosing my way up into that drift. And that's when I felt, felt that pressure on my lower back as if something fell down and hit me. But um, I'm going to tilt the scales more towards it wasn't anything ghostly and maybe it wasn't my dad going no son you're not going to go any further i i think it was all up here i just i just kind of do that's kind of the way the needle's pointing right now with me regarding that um oh <laughs> wait what do you like and dislike about the other mine exploring channels Oh boy, now here's, now here's a question that'll get me in hot water. Well, okay, so. <sighs> yeah, I don't wanna get in hot water here. But first of all, it's really good that, that YouTube has a, a, a very wide and, and dif diverse amount of people that are out there trying to create content in the abandoned mine exploring genre, okay? Now, I'm not talking about the selfie stick heroes that are out there that are just, you know, on, out on a weekend, snap a camera or a GoPro on a selfie stick or your forehead and then go into abandoned mine and throw it up on YouTube. I'm talking about that. I'm talking about abandoned uh, uh, mine channels, you know, like, um, you know, like Frank's in Canada and Justin's and the, the, the folks out of the UK and Adventure R Us and um, Mines of the West. And, uh, and there's people out there that are, are really do, trying to do their best within the confines of their abilities, because at the end of the day, that's all we really can do, right? Okay, all of us have different abilities. We have different um, uh, editing abilities, computer abilities. Um, we have different ways on how we portray what we're seeing and doing to our audience via dialogue. It's, it's all different and we're all doing it within the confines of our abilities. However, that being said, if I had one piece of advice to all abandoned mine explorers out there, and that would be this. You have to put your camera out in front and make your camera priority. Your camera cannot just be coming along for the ride. 
okay? You make your camera a priority and you have to pretend that you're basically, you're the eyeballs of an audience of thousands, if not tens of thousands of people. So you, you have to make the camera the priority. You have to put it in front of every, everything else that you're doing. If the camera is just along for the ride, okay, and, and you're the one exploring the, the mine and the camera, then what you end up with is, is way too much movement, way too much panning, and uh, what it boils down to, and unfortunately with some channels out there, there's, there's just, there's not enough Dramamine in the world to make it watchable because the, the camera's swinging too wildly back and forth, too wildly up and down, et cetera, et cetera. And it only takes a few minutes of that, especially if you're trying to watch it on like a big screen, smart TV, 55 inches, and people are just like, oh, you know, and they can't watch no more and they click off. The camera has to be priority. Put that out in front of you, keep that out in front of you, and make it priority of the entire Explore. You said, oh, here you go, yeah, you, you said long ago that you hate ropes and climbing gear and much prefer free climbing. Why? <laughs> I still do to this very day. I hate climbing gear. I absolutely hate it. Because, see, I, I grew up free climbing. I was a free climber. I loved climbing, you know, I'm, I mean, not things that were too extreme, but good good challenging rock walls, boulder falls, things of that nature. That's what I did when I was younger and I feel really comfortable with it even even today. When you get into ropes and climbing gear and all of that stuff, when you cross over into that dynamic, look out because every knucklehead out there that has any bit of, of uh, climbing and roping experience, um, they, 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 they come at you like, you don't know what you're doing, blah, 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 rah, rah, rah. and it's like, um, I call it, what do I, yeah, I, I call it climber's bravado. Oh, there is nothing worse than climber's bravado and having to sit there and listen to it. You know, all these guys, you know, they mean well, of course, but it sometimes it just gets so ridiculous. It's like, what, well, what, well, you're not using a... A, a, a this knot or a that device or a blah blah oh it just it, it's like the, the bravado just gets ridiculous especially if you're associated with with clubs and things of that nature i don't have a tolerance for it i don't i i just use i use the equipment that i that i have and i use it within the confines of my abilities and um yeah, of course, I'm not able to, I'm not able to do what, what I used to do when I was 20 years old. I mean, I'm 50 years old now, but, and then, and here's the other, here's the other side of it. When you have all that gear dangling off of you and you're inside of the mine, you're basically turned yourself into a human mobile or a wind chime. It's clickety clack and bangity bang and knockity knock the whole way through the mine. You got all this crap hanging off of you. And it's just such a distraction to your audience to have that dangling. I mean, there is some situations where you just have to have it. Like when I was in the in the um, Thunder Ridge mine, I, I could have taken it off, but I didn't know what I was getting into. So um, I just don't. I don't. I don't like. I don't. I just don't like climbing in rope gear unless I absolutely have to have it. You know, it's funny, guys. <laughs> I've seen. I've seen YouTube videos where these guys go into, like, it's just maybe a, a mild step above uh, a, what I call a tourist mine. And they've got every clickety-clack and dangly-do you can possibly imagine dangling off their bodies. I mean, complete with an array of three different air monitors of three, you know, it's just, you know, and, and what that is, it's, 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 um, it's all that bravado. You know, it's like, oh, look at, look at, I'm, I'm dangling with equipment, so I know what I'm doing. I'm a professional. You know, it's, it's that kind of, that kind of attitude. But at the end of the day, are you making a better production? Are you giving your audience better content? You know, are you taking, are you raising the bar? Okay, sure, sure, you have all this fancy stuff, okay? 
But at the end of the day, did you make a better widget? You know, a lot of times, no, no, you didn't, no. So that's my spiel about climbing gear. It's a love-hate relationship. Okay, three more to go, I promise. <laughs> All right, what's the next one here? Tell us a little bit about old Bob. Yeah, so uh, I, uh, how should I do this? You know, I was going to make a video all about old Bob, and um, maybe what I should do here is uh, just, just say, uh, hold off. I'm going to do a video all about old Bob. I think that's the better way because uh, this old Jeep here, it's, um, he's, like, he's like family. He really is to me. And uh, there's a backstory to him and all kinds of neat stuff that I've done to him over the years. So let's hold off on that. I'm going to, I'll produce a video all about Bob. Or what about Bob? Wait a minute, I think that's been taken. <laughs> um, but all about old Bob uh, when I get settled in down in Arizona, okay? Um, you caused a bit of a stir on the Vice Channel's video. Tell us a bit more about that. Yeah, I guess I did, didn't I? <laughs> hey, I had to. I, I, you know, I just had to. Okay, so Vice, you guys probably seen their videos on YouTube. Anyways, they, they highlighted this individual. And what he does is he is a denim hunter. Now, all of us know, especially all of us within the mine exploring community, denim hunters are the scourge of abandoned mine exploration because, now I'm not saying all of them do this, but many have. They, they, they damage abandoned mines. They, just, they do things trying to find denim and artifacts and other things so that they can sell them via their in their on their store um at a merchandise shop or on ebay whatever the case may be which is all completely illegal a lot of all of these items are protected by the antiquities laws etc 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 so all of a sudden vice comes along now whether you're a fan of vice or not but that's that's irrelevant in this situation but obviously vice news did not do their homework so all of a sudden this guy comes along and it's like, hey, I pull, you know, I search for denim and make lots of money, you know, in abandoned mines, blah, blah, blah. And then when you watch the video, here you got this, this individual, um, you know, killing a snake and making all kinds of Belarus statements like, oh yeah, I've had friends die all the time in abandoned mines. And it was just, it was so over the top, ugly. I, I had to say something because... To a lot of people that don't know about the abandoned mine exploring genre or the or the community, all of a sudden somebody that somebody watches that video and their takeaway is is oh this is perfectly fine oh yeah okay going in abandoned mines and 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 acting this way and doing these things is is perfectly okay and that was the image that they projected and that's why I jumped on there and made the comment that I did and I basically said in a nutshell. No, 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 uh-uh-uh, this person didn't, um, does not represent the abandoned mine exploring community, et cetera, et cetera. And if you want to go over to that video um, and find it, you can read the comment that I made, but that pretty much sums it up. I didn't want people to get confused uh, and confuse what this, what this guy does with the rest of us who are trying our hardest to be good stewards of abandoned mines and, and the community. Okay, that pretty much sums it up. And by the way, Vice, if you're watching this next time, do your homework. Sheesh. All right, and finally, what are your plans for the future of the channel? Well, I talked a little bit about this at the beginning of this video, so um, I want to keep the channel fresh. I, I, I don't want each and every single episode to become predictable. I, I want to keep exploring different, um, 
different things. Like here recently, we did we did the on-screen maps, and uh, prior to that, it was a schnozzleator, and prior to that, it was uh, banter with Mr. M and Randy, and prior to that, it was me solo ex exploring. Well, now the channel is back to me solo exploring again, so I'm I'm trying to implement. Um, more things in I'm trying to get back to my roots. I think I've, I've I've done that pretty well over the course of this last last summer. The 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 channel when I first started it had an outline and I got away from that outline a little bit. And now I've course corrected and got things back to where I want them to be and now I can add these extra things on top of um solo ex exploring so whatever i can find to keep things fresh um there's a lot of folks out there where uh in, this is my opinion their their channels on the topic are very cookie cutter and very predictable you know it's you might as well take some you know the star shape when you're making cr christmas cookies and go because every week it's the same thing predictable predictable. You understand what I'm saying. I don't want to go down that road. I want to step away from that. I, every time you guys click on one of my videos, I, I really want you saying, what is that crazy fool up to this weekend? <laughs> you know, I, I really want you guys to like, like second guess me. It's like, well, we all know that he's going to go into, abandon, into an abandoned mine. But how is he going to do it? How is he going to document it? See, I, 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 I want to keep you off balance a little bit. And that's what makes it fun and unpredictable. Okay. Um, I think that's why, I, I think that's a lot why you guys enjoy my channel is because, uh, you know, not only because of my stunning personality, but, um, <laughs> yeah, I'm laying it on thick here. Um, but because, I, you know, I, I, I try to keep it fun and interesting and informative and, and I, I talk a lot about the things that I find, and um, um, I make a mis few mistakes here and there, as anybody does when you're trying to maintain dialogue. But for the most part, I can when I see something, I can very accurately explain it to you, why it is like that, why the miners did it that way, et cetera, et cetera. And that pretty much kind of uh, formulates the, the show into a much nicer, well-rounded production. So... I've got a few more cool ideas on the on the table that I want to experiment with. You guys really enjoyed the on-screen maps, especially when I got rid of the um, the bell. Sorry about that. It was experimental. Don't beat me up so hard, golly, guys. Um, but uh, yeah, there's some more things I want to experiment going down the line. But I'm certainly not done exploring abandoned mines. I'm having way too much fun doing this. I enjoy entertaining you guys. I, there's a lot of you out there um, that are not able to do this activity and you're living vicariously through me. I, I totally understand that. And that's why I do my best to, 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 to bring the best possible content to you uh, that I possibly can. Yeah, yeah. So uh, that's pretty much it in a nutshell. That's it. That's the end of our questions for today. So guys, um, I thank you so much for following me along this summer. It was a lot of fun. I enjoyed it. I could tell that you guys enjoyed it. And uh, I really hope to bring you even more cool stuff uh, this, this coming winter after I get settled back into Arizona. So with that, uh, I'm going to let you go. And um, yeah, I'll see you again sometime down the road. All right, take care, everybody. Bye-bye.